Let's do it. Let's do it. So we're going to talk about Havel, A Life, a biography of Vaclav Havel that you wrote. You, uh, Michael Zantowski, and this was back in 2014 when it first came out. So I'm going to read out your bio from that point, and maybe you can fill me in about the interim. Uh, Michael Zantowski is the current, yeah, you see here you were the current Czech ambassador to the court of St. James at that point in England. He was among the founding members of the movement that coordinated the overthrow of the communist regime in, Czech, in sure. Czechoslovakia. In January 1990, he became the spokesman, press secretary, and advisor to his lifelong friend, President Václav Havel. He has combined a career in politics and the foreign service with work as an author and translator into Czech of many contemporary British and American writers. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. That was 2014, as you said, and uh, since then I, I mostly did one thing. I am now the executive director of the Václav Havel Library in Prague, which is a presidential legacy institution that uh, collects and researches and promotes and advocates the legacy of Václav Havel. So I mostly continue to do what I have been doing in one way or another over the last 30 plus uh, years. Okay. So as I say, we're going to talk about uh, your biography of Havel. Uh, both the writing of it and the content, because I'm particularly interested in the roles of various people as they're connected to the book. And so you writing a biography of a close friend is particularly interesting. How did you go about writing an honest biography of a good friend? Well, that's of course a crucial question and uh, I developed some feeling for it as I went along because I never really planned to write a biography of Václav Havel and only when he died and in 2011 and I was trying to cope with the shock and with the grief and the loss of it, and with the feeling of indebtedness to him personally and politically, I realized that maybe writing a book would repay that, that at least in a small part. As I went along, I also realized that writing a book about someone who's been close to you is not uh, perhaps not even the best uh, vantage point that you know one can. Uh, write from and uh, and certainly presents uh, specific uh, difficulties and, and obstacles and uh, I say in the introduction to the book that what helped me in the end was my original profession I, I, I had been trained as a clinical psychologist and uh, worked as one for a decade and uh, in that business you learn what is called the clinical attitude to take a step back some distance from uh, your patient on, from your subject and try to deal with his story disinterestedly unemotionally and hopefully objectively and that's what I've been trying to do with uh, uh, with Havel and it was also one of the reasons why I chose to write the biography in in English. I, I was thinking about writing it in Czech uh, but you know in the end uh, writing it in language that is not my own helped me to take that crucial step back and and gain <laughs> obtain some distance that's it's it's uh, you know a, a, a simple trick, but you know to some extent I think it worked. So what specifically were some of the difficulties? Oh, difficulty was the man. 
uh, as always in biography of the woman, because uh, we people are made of uh, various facets and various parts, and some of those parts are more attractive than some of the other parts, and uh, some of our stories are more heroic than some of our other stories. And writing is of necessity a process of selection. But if you are biased, if you identify too much with the subject of your biography, then you make a biased selection and you run the risk of writing what is called hagiography mm -hmm. and admiring account of someone's life which is usually not uh, really worth reading. So <laughs> I try to avoid that. And Can you give me some specifics? I will, but I will add that first that you know one person who helped me do that was Havel himself because for most of his life he was professing and uh, and trying to live by a precept which he called living in truth. So I sometimes when I wrote the book I had a feeling that he was watching me over my shoulder and that he certainly would not want me to, yes. to lie about him. And so what, it was a kind of a gut feel that no, I because I know him so well, I know he wouldn't want me to, to talk yeah. about this. Yeah. And so there are, you know, some sp some obvious examples. One of uh, the most oft-cited is Havel's uh, uh, relationship to women and his uh, very unique kind of marriage, which uh, included numerous uh, infidelities and uh, affairs, small and... Uh, and large. Was and it, it so, sorry? Was it was the number outrageous, or was it within the realm of okay? This is was it pathological or not? Let's well, put look, it that I mean, way. In this area, outrageous in the eye of the beholder. It's, <laughs> okay. it's, uh, I don't think it was uh, pathologically out of the norm. No. Okay. Uh, but he had a large appetite, though. So. Uh, I, I don't even think, I mean, his, uh, I think, in fact, and I try to imply it in the book, you know, his wandering eye was uh, much more, more stronger than his appetite. I mean, so many of his, uh, quote, affairs, unquote, were purely platonic. I mean, there, uh, there was... Uh, uh, not really anything serious going on, but there was uh, an interest that he liked to express. And, uh, and much of it, I realize, is, would be considered inappropriate or outrageous uh, in these days and times. But Havel was a young man of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And the 1960s, for those of us who remember it, were a very well, a wildish period in, in many respects, including that of sexual relationships and, uh, and so on. And in this respect, he was not completely atypical, popular male of his uh, times. Plus, he was an artist. <laughs> Plus he was an artist, he was a, not only was he an artist, but he was a bohemian in more than one sense. Okay. He was a bohemian by virtue of being an artist, and he was a bohemian by virtue of being a Czech. It's literal. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to read out a fairly lengthy passage here from a book that, Basically, it was one long interview. Right. Uh, disturbing the peace. Disturbing the peace. I think it's fascinating, and you don't deal with it very effectively, but these are his own words. 
and it's about uh, paradox. I'm going to take a little time here sure. to, to, to read this out. My life, my work, my position, everything I've done seems intertwined with a suspiciously large number of paradoxes. I get involved in many things, yet I'm an expert in none. I've become known as a political activist, but, uh, and this was written in 60, sorry, 86, 87. Right. So he says, uh, I've become known as a, a, a political activist, but I've never been a politician, never wanted to be one. Uh, and then he goes on to list uh, his, some of his uh, private paradoxes. Uh, I myself am always ruffling the surface somewhere, yet I long for nothing more than peace and quiet. I have an extraordinary love of harmony, comfort, agreement, and friendly mutual understanding between people, I'd be happiest if everyone simply liked everyone else, always. Tension, conflict, misunderstanding, uncertainty, and confusion upset me, and yet my position in the world has always been and continues to be deeply controversial. I've been in conflict with the state and with various institutions and organizations in my life. My reputation is that of a, an eternal rebel and protester, but whom nothing is sac to whom nothing is sacred. And my plays are anything but a picture of peace and harmony. I'm very unsure of myself, almost a neurotic. I tend to panic easily. I'm always terrified of something scared even that the telephone might ring. I'm plagued by self-doubts, and I'm always masochistically blaming or cursing myself for something. And yet I appear to many, and to a degree rightly so, as someone who is sure of himself with an enviable equanimity, quiet, level-headed, constant, persistent, down-to-earth, always standing up for himself. I'm rational and systematic. I love order and orderliness. I'm disciplined and reliable, at times almost bureaucratically pedantic. At the same time, I, I'm oversensitive, almost a little sentimental. Someone who's, not much longer here, who's always been drawn to everything mysterious, magic, irrational, inexplicable, grotesque, and absurd everything that escapes order and makes it problematic. I'm a sociable person who likes being with people, organizing events, bringing people together, a cheerful fellow, sometimes the conversational life of the party, one who enjoys drinking and the various pleasures and trespasses of life. And at the same time, I'm happiest when alone and consequently my life is a constant escape into solitude and quiet introspection. Just finally here, at my core, I'm shy and timid. And yet in some forums, I'm notorious as a rabble rouser who is not afraid to say the toughest things right to someone's face. For many people, I'm a constant source of hope. And yet I'm always succumbing to depressions, uncertainty and doubt. And I'm constantly having to look hard for my own inner hope and revive it. So he's coming across wonderfully honestly here. And isn't this what we want in a politician? Absolutely. And, uh, and this is something, you know, the whole passage, uh, I think, illustrates why he was such a, an extraordinary human being. But... Paradoxically, and this is another paradox, it's not about the paradoxes that he's, uh, he's writing about. I mean, at closer look, uh, because we are made up of so many parts, I know most people, you know, are internally so conflicted, uh, contradictory, paradoxical, mm, as Harvard. But he had the exceptional quality, and that's in the last paragraph of the quote of introspection. 
I mean, introspection is something that uh, uh, few people do well. You know, most people rationalize, prettify, skew what they really are about inside. But Havel was not. Havel was completely honest and truthful and he had the gift of the language to to express these various parts and drives and instincts and and so on and so this was one quality that made him special the other quality that made him special was that he was probably the most responsible human being i have uh, I have ever met. That's why he felt uh, he went to extremes there. I mean, he felt responsible for things that and guilty about things that he was not guilty or responsible for. But uh, in the larger framework of humanity, he still felt uh, he he was uh, responsible. And the combination of the responsibility with the gift of introspection and and truthfulness uh, you know was a unique and formidable mix that made him who he was you point out in in your biography that he would confess to these various uh, peccadilloes, often in public, so that you couldn't really get him, you know, because he's the one that confessed. He confessed to his, his wife. He confessed to his wife, and he spoke about his uh, peccadilloes, as you say, in his speeches, in uh, interviews uh, to his friends. And yes, uh, you know, most politicians get caught by keeping things secret and you could never have couldn't be arrested keeping a secret i mean paradoxically again you know that's what some of his friends uh, lovingly reproached him for even during the communist days that he couldn't keep a secret when you told him something the next thing you knew he told it to someone else and that was the end of the secret yeah, it's almost like he felt like if, and I, I think you referenced this, he felt like if he s told his wife and others about what he did, then that made it okay. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I, I think, and I think I wrote that he told her because uh, he felt it was his responsibility to tell her. And you know, cope with the consequences. Not that it made his life simpler or less complicated, no. I mean, he somehow added to the complications by telling her and... Uh, uh, but that's, that's who he was. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't do otherwise. You talk about responsibility. Um... And there was also guilt. I uh, thought this was quite interesting. You said that uh, he felt guilty that he came from a privileged background. Yeah. He certainly did. And, uh, and the guilt feeling stayed with him for most of his uh, uh, life and started in his childhood because most of his... Uh, mates at school were from poor uh, peasant families in the summer place, the summer villa, the Havels, his parents had, mm -hmm. where he went to school during, during the war, and, uh, and he wanted to be like that. He, and, uh, well, they, and they wouldn't let him into university because of his privilege. And background. then they wouldn't let him into the university, and... Uh, uh, and that, you know, made him uh, an outcast. But he enjoyed being an outcast. I mean, he he probably f felt it was, um, I may be going too far here, but he may have felt that 
it was the rightful punishment for uh, his privileged origin that he became an outcast. Yeah, yeah, that's it's almost <laughs> self-flagellation or something uh, like that, isn't it? It's, 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 and and you, why would you feel guilty unless it was sort of drummed into him when he was younger? Why would you feel he, he had no choice in where he was born? He was born into a rich family. That wasn't his not. fault. And it was not drummed into him. I mean, he was uh, brought up uh, as careless and worryless as uh, the times allowed. It was uh, something in him and, you know, as a psychologist you can't help feeling that uh, it had something to do with uh, his capacity for introspection and when you look carefully inside yourself you know you always find something to be sorry for <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, maybe that's because he just had what, he's had such an idyllic childhood that he had to make stuff like this up to beat himself up with, or what? No, but uh, uh, at least in, in part, it was uh, the outcome, the result of, uh, of what's called peer pressure. I mean, if uh, mm -hmm. you are the privileged one and uh, all the schoolmates around you are poor, then... You know, they are not the outcasts. You are the outcast because you you don't belong. Yeah. And and it this need to belong. Yes, that's was strong. Very, um, yeah. Always. Okay. You talk about uh, all writing and, and particularly biography being a, a a question or a process of selection. So, what did you keep out? And why did you keep it out? Well, uh, I tried to leave the important things in. So I, I wrote about the important events and times and decisions in his life. That was uh, a clear uh, choice. I did not plan to write a, a tabloid type of biography, so I did not spend uh, so much time writing about his uh, intimate life, but I tried to take care that I did not leave out anything that I could be accused of suppressing or uh, censoring. Mm -hmm. So the outlines are there, the details are not. And finally, to the extent possible, I try to leave myself out of the story because I wanted to write a story about him, not about myself. Although I was there with him at uh, many times, uh, especially during his presidency, you don't find much of me in it. No, all. you don't. No. And yet, uh, the fact that that you were appointed ambassador to the United States, that in itself tells me quite a bit, and then to England. Well, look, I mean, people, I'm not saying I was, uh, it, that was what happened to me, but, you know, people have been sent as ambassadors into exile to many countries, uh, <laughs> uh, half of, Americans started their lives as exiles, not to mention the Australians and, and others. So it's not automatically. It tells me that you were pretty close. I mean, uh, it, that's evidence that you, are, you know. It means that, and it also means after the revolution in 1989, we had a significant shortage of, of manpower mm -hmm. uh, because especially in the state Paratus, because half of the people there we could not trust, and uh, the other half were incompetent. And but most of us uh, have not uh, had not uh, been abroad or had much experience with the outside world during the uh, twenty years before the revolution. And I was uh, 
among them, but I, I made my living as a translator. So at least I had some experience with uh, the American world and uh, people and issues from, from books and from, you know, the New York Review of Books and the New Yorker, the things that, you know, I read if you, when I managed to get hold of. Meaning that, you know, when it came to ambassadors, I was one of the few who could speak the language uh, 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 relatively well and who, who knew roughly. But plus he could trust you. I hope that was a part of the consideration, yes. <laughs> uh, how does writing uh, a biography, how was that informed by your being a translator? That's a question I didn't really spend much time thinking about, but, you know, certainly, uh, especially writing the English, you know, I drew on a body of uh, language and of uh, syntax and uh, idiom uh, that I had almost exclusively from my work as a translation. So I, I probably couldn't do it without that. And I, you know, funny thing is that after 20 or 30 years of working as a translator, uh, you begin to think in the other language too. And that's a good start. And the second phase is, phase is you begin to dream in the other language. Mm -hmm. And dreaming is important and... Uh, <laughs> And certainly helps uh, while writing. That's all I can say. I want to, uh, now this isn't as lengthy a quote, but it, uh, it's Havel talking about the plays that he wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just, uh, and it's from Disturbing the Peace, and I just paraphrased it. So here's what he thinks about theatre. Theatre should not be about making people's lives easier, presenting positive heroes into which they can project all their hopes, about sending them home feeling that these heroes will take care of things for them. It's not about soothing them with merciful lies or false offers of help. It's about propelling them in the most dramatic possible way into the depths of a question they should not, cannot avoid asking, to stick their nose into their own misery, into my misery, into our common misery, reminding them that it's time to do something about it. The only ways out, the only solutions, the only hopes that are worth anything are the ones we discover ourselves, within ourselves, and for ourselves. Theatre can help us to do this. Seeing the outlines of horror in theatre induces us to face up to it. Yeah. I, I just thought... Uh, Man, that's that is such a lucid way of describing absurdist theater. I don't think I've read anything much better than that. Uh, well, you know, Havel was a particular type of an absurdist author. He was, of course, uh, in his early place. He was much influenced by people like. Uh, Eugene Ionesco and uh, in particular Samuel Beckett. I mean, he had he thought of Beckett as a godlike mm -hmm. figure, mm -hmm. and actually he wrote that much in one of the letters to him. But there was a difference that uh, you came across in in the quote, like for Havel, a theatre play for Beckett was a way to stick our collective gnosis and individual gnosis 
in our misery, but Beckett never derived any hope from that or any intention to change this. You know, for Beckett, it was a way to realize the utter hopelessness of it all and live with it. Yeah. Mm. For Havel, it was to transcend it, to derive some kind of a solution, some kind of a hope out of the misery, and that makes him a more optimistic, if you will, or more positive uh, uh, writer than Beckett. Yeah, I see, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I would say that what I got from reading this was Havel wanted to, as you say, to stick our noses in the misery, but then he he felt that the natural reaction to that was in the audience. It was up to the audience to make that decision. Am I? I'm going to do something about this. Um, my life is not is not hopeless. I'm going to freaking change yeah. my life. Yeah. He he was presenting this yeah. awful yeah. shit so that we would we would yeah. we would work to transcend it. Yeah, but uh, uh, that's what I been trying to say. I mean, he offers a way out by doing something about it. You but, know. but he's not saying that. You can watch a Beckett uh, play and feel that kind of awful meaninglessness, but it's up to the, you in the audience. Beckett has, has put this out there, and it is. It's, it's awful, but it's up to the audience. Uh, uh... No, for, for Beckett, I, you know, we, we clearly disagree. For, for Beckett, there was no way out. For, for Havel, there was a way out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just thought it was beautifully... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it's I nice. mean, and I guess that's the thing that got me thinking about your relationship with him. He must have been... A, like, someone who can write this well about, uh, about theatre yeah. must be a pretty special... Uh, well, you know, it's uh, Havel as a writer is a two-faced creature uh, made up of his plays on the one hand and of his essays on on the other. Mm -hmm. And his plays and his essays deal with very similar fundamental issues and concepts. In his essays, Havel treats the questions, the issues totally seriously and the way out of it he tries to discover and describe and delineate the possible ways out of it offering some kind of, a, of, of an outcome. In his plays, which are invariably comedies, yes. and he only wrote comedies, he makes fun of the same <laughs> intentions and uh, well-meaning ideals etc etc that he describes in in his essays none of his plays comes to a good end i mean they all end up with the main characters as failures you know no exception yeah yeah and yet in his essays he offers the power of the powerless the life in truth the you know, some kind of a of a secular salvation, but there's no salvation in the place. <laughs> <laughs> he leaves that up to yeah the the audience. One of the things that's fascinating is that lines from his plays were used by everyone in you know in the Czech Republic. They became sort of common lingo. That's a, that's quite extraordinary. Yeah, especially in his fast creative period when he became famous with plays like The Garden Party, etc., etc., and we were 15 year old or something, so we knew half of the play by yes, heart. It's a bit like Monty Python, right? It was exactly like Monty Python, and we used the lines from the plays to <laughs> amuse ourselves. Yeah. But even later, during the 70s, especially with his one act, by the audience about the brewer and uh, and the intellectual, you know, some of the lines like 
you know, the brewer drunken line, them are the paradoxes, aren't they? Uh, so that was a folk wisdom yeah. kind of yeah. uh, 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 quote that the people adopted and there were a few others. I don't know, it's interesting too that he uh, spent a year working in a coal brewery this would have been obviously communist times, mm. and made made something from that. Created created something from that. And Klima was a garbage man, and he created something out of that too. Yeah, well, again, it came about as a re- not as a result of a, a planned thing. You know, Havel felt he says he felt the need to make some money, but. The facts do not really corroborate it. He did that more money mm-hmm. uh, from uh, his uh, uh, fees from his place than he ever earned in the brewery. And uh, and one of the paradoxes of the of his brewery period was that he came there every morning. At, they started very early at six o'clock in his Mercedes yes. car, you yes. know. And, <laughs> <laughs> Never made a good proletarian. But they accepted him, though, didn't they? Like, he's such a, a you know, he's such a congenial guy that they didn't... He was, the... a genial, he was a very congenial guy, and uh, I understand that many of his co-workers in the brewery were uh, Romas, gypsies. Yes. And that, that meant outcasts. And he was an outcast to another. Outcast is always a good you know, match, and he experienced the same thing for most part in prison. And in prison, you know, intellectuals are not always treated uh, by the other inmates very well, but he was, uh, they, they could recognize one of, one of their own when they, when they saw him. He, mm-hmm. he did that quite well. Yeah. Did, he didn't escape j- uh, jail. Did, did you escape to jail? Uh, well, I I never spent any significant time in jail except for, you know, short periods of interrogation that uh, I could uh, easily put behind me. But Havel spent more than five Four. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was just because he was... They saw him as a, obviously a potential leader of an insurrection. Is that... Like, why, why would... Why would you not go and he would go? Uh, because he was prominent. Yeah. He was seen as a possible leader. Mm-hmm. And he was a leader. He, was a, he initiated the Charter 77 uh, movement. It uh, wouldn't have happened uh, without him, I think. And uh, so he was... Uh, he sticked his neck out and that's what happened. Yeah, if you did, yeah, I I was relatively unimportant. But you were important to him, though. Well, I only really met him personally when he was uh, released from prison in 1983. Didn't you carry his? Yes, yes. I carried his personal effects uh, out of the. No, 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 I didn't. I said rightly. I only met him then. In 1983 mm-hmm. and then we became friends and then he was again. imprisoned again yeah. in 1989 yeah. for a shorter period six months and at the end of that period I, I did the heroic deed of carrying but you but you were very proud of that of course I was very proud of that it was <laughs> like a badge of honor <laughs> for sure yeah okay it, it Again, just getting back to you being a friend and writing a biography. Um, any any other thoughts on that? Mm. No, it comes naturally. I I would never want to write a biography of a person I hate. There are such biographies, but uh, uh, yeah, it's and some vengeance of them, and yeah, yeah, and some of them are not bad. So I I could only write about someone who was either close to me or whose work was uh, a matter of uh, 
fascination to me. I wrote another biography a long time ago, and that was on Woody Allen. And oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. And I, of course, didn't know him then. And uh, But and it was just because you admired him so much back then? I admired his films, and I also translated some of his short stories in into Czech. They're very funny, yeah? They're extremely yeah. funny. <laughs> and uh, so he was a revelation right. for me. And, and because during the communist times, his films, none of his films were shown here. So... He was only known through my translations of his short stories, which somehow made him, somehow made me an expert on Woody Allen, and hence the book. So, what do you think about the, you know, the accusations and all that? What would you take on all that? Oh well, I did translate. He published a book of memoirs about two years ago. Yes, and I translated that, and. Uh, you know, half of the book is uh, as interesting and as funny as uh, I knew him. The other half of the book is very sad because he obsesses with uh, the accusation and with the need to protest his innocence, etc., etc. He's been cleared by every criminal and legal authority that uh, examined the case. That would be enough for him, for me, but it's not enough for him. He will. It's his reputation, obviously. It, yeah. yeah, but I think it, it harmed him personally and damaged him. But, you know, I, unlike some other people these days, I don't think it will change my view of his movies no. or, you know. <laughs> You're still going to laugh. Yeah, I'm still going to laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in putting, uh, uh, writing the biography of a politician you want to get history right obviously yes. but it's your it's your take on what happened well you know you want to get the history right and history is uh, a question of facts so it's uh, important uh, to do the research and it's also important to have been there as uh, as an eyewitness to to many of the events but it's, at least I think, it's a relatively simple thing. To get the man right, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> Where's the problem specifically then? You, I know you make a point about a statue. You know, you, you know, a human being is multifaceted and a statue, it's, how did you put it? It's, uh, a multifaceted man can't be reduced to a sculpture. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, a fairly obvious uh, uh, problem. Mm -hmm. and, and again, if you want to spend enough time on presenting the various facets and, uh, and their relative weight, you get some of it, you may get right. But the ultimate problem, and then, you know, I would uh, have to get back to Beckett and uh, you never know anyone else. Well, that's because they're putting on all masks and whatever, and they what? But he wasn't he honest with you? Wasn't I mean? You, that's even you're right. Of course, yeah. you're right. Even yeah. your closest friends, you just yeah. don't know what's going no, no, on. You can you can think of a hundred explanations for this, but uh, but Havel would say, you know, as he said about other things, you know, people are ultimately a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so that's what I, makes I, him fascinating. I try to respect that. And that's what I, and I was, some of the reviews of the book uh, were slightly critical of me for that. I, I tried to not, not to provide cast in stone answers for some of the questions. I, I tried to suggest that perhaps this could be the explanation, but you know, I, I, I never pretended I, I knew for sure. Okay, just winding down here. Yeah, uh, I interpret Havel as saying that his plays are there almost to goad people into action. What do you want your biography to goad people into? Nothing. 
I uh, <clears throat> I don't think books should be written to make people do something. I think they are written out of uh, some inner need to say something and they are read out of the inner read of the readers to read about these things and whether they make them do something or not you know it's uh, I I've never thought of books as as recipes or handbooks I mean there are handbooks but you know the books I I have in mind are, are not uh, not cookbooks no but I think it, when I read a book quite often I'm motivated to do something yeah but uh, it's quite likely that a hundred people reading the same book will be motivated to do hundred different things yes yes, <laughs> yes. that's right there's as many books as there are readers of, of course I just thought maybe you had some kind of uh, intention but maybe not no 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 okay so can you answer why again why you wrote and and why you write biography because I felt that was uh, the right thing to do for my friend and for myself and for people who might enjoy the book. And why is that important? Because it is to me. Why? Yeah. Because uh, that would bring me back to Havel because uh, he believed all his life that one should live according to his uh, identity, his uh, inner self and do the things he felt uh, the right things to do. And, uh, and there's not much beyond that. You just felt it was the right thing to do? I felt it was the right thing to do. Okay. I'm sorry to be disappointing, but... <laughs> Just uh, finally, uh, I'm going to the acknowledgments page at the back of your uh, biography. And uh, you talk about Vaclav Havel is dead, but I still owe him a huge debt for being a constant presence, inspiration, and an invisible guide in writing this book. As you say, uh, he was on your shoulder and his brother Ivan was very important in his life and to you too in writing this book. Yeah, he was uh, and a friend, but uh, he left us uh, uh. a couple of years ago. And finally, uh, uh, can you speak just a bit about, I interviewed Eric Ormsby some years ago. He was your first reader and you mentioned him. Uh, what did he do for you? Uh, well, you know, Eric is my brother-in-law and uh, he is uh, a poet of great sensitivity in my mind and uh, of uh, a mastery of uh, the English language that I will, I can never hope to achieve. So he was a natural first uh, reader when I wrote the first uh, draft of this book and as a scholar in medieval Islam he's also uh, an expert on history and on how you present history to later uh, generations so it was a no-brainer. Well I, I want to thank you uh, as one of the many readers if you're biography it was uh, I was motivated to come and interview you and so thank you very thank much you. thank you for showing the interest and for reading the book uh, we didn't talk much about the uh, the library I don't know if you want to end with that I think we will okay so let's I'll just see. I'll just say that uh, Michael Zantowski is currently the executive director of the Vaclav Havel library in Prague thanks very much again sure Okay. Been a pleasure.